Welcome. Uh, welcome to the uh, South Star Symposium uh, in Japan um, in 2016. Um, I am George Takeuchi. I am the uh, director of the South Star Program on Japan and East Asia uh, in, the uh, in the Tower Center at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. Um, and I'm also a social scientist at SMU. Well, before starting uh, the program, I'd like to introduce our staff members who are helping um, uh, organize uh, this event. Uh, without those staff members, we cannot do this event. Um, but Bora Rassi, um, coming from SLU. <laughs> Harry Hansen. From Power Center, we have done 50 events a year, and then you know people think that how many staff members you have? 10 or 20? Actually, we only have three, and then unfortunately, one more person who made this uh, conference possible uh, tremendously, uh, contributing to making this uh, uh, conference um, possible. Uh, that's Ray Rafidi, who unfortunately cannot travel to Japan for very good reason. Um, his son uh, is graduating from high school so uh, this weekend, so he cannot travel, but uh, he also uh, helped us uh, organize uh, this event. And also, uh, we asked um, 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 Hiroko Naito uh, from, um, for, to help us. Um, Hiroko is a PhD candidate of the Keio University SSC, and uh, she um, has um, been the member of the Tower Center uh, for this conference and uh, um, bridging uh, our staff members the Dallas side and the um, Japanese side. So thank you very much. Um, and also um, Matthew Wright, um, is Matthew, uh, so he's helping at the receptionist desk. He is the undergraduate, our junior student, uh, but he's the uh, student worker of the Tower Center. Uh, we have that kind of um, um, system um, and then students are working for us. Uh, so Matthew is also helping us for organization. <laughs> uh, and also uh, there is a camera person, uh, Chen Ho, <laughs> Mr. Her. Uh, he's uh, he's also a graduate student of Keio University and um, also uh, originally from China. And uh, so he is uh, in charge of um, uh, uh, taking photos. So uh, if you want to. Um, you know, have the picture uh, on the Tower Center website, please ask him to take the picture. <laughs> well, this is a very timely uh, symposium. Um, currently in the United States, um, everybody is asking what's going on in politics, uh, especially what's going on with Trump, right? Um, well, um, I don't think that he will become president, I hope not, but, uh, um, but at the same time, there is some like a trend, a uh, new trend that is uh, ongoing uh, behind the rise of Trump, and that is, I would say, the rise of anti-internationalism. And uh, so uh, this will become, uh, this will be a very uh, significant um, symposium uh, to discuss the uh, U.S.-Japan relationship and security of the Asia-Pacific in the age of the rise of anti-internationalism uh, in the United States. And what happened in East China Sea yesterday actually made this uh, symposium even more meaningful. So uh, that's actually, um, I'm also looking forward to uh, the discussion uh, today and uh, tomorrow. I'd like to introduce briefly about uh, Southern Methodist University Power Center Sandstar program and uh, City of Dallas. So SMU is a uh, liberal arts college um, with, uh, um, with uh, uh, the power center that is a policy center. Um, in Japan, many of um, the universities, uh, many of the top research universities are also the best um, university for college education, which means undergraduate education. Well, uh, in the United States, in the research university, basically professors teach graduate students, and graduate students teach undergraduate students. Well, I know that because I went to graduate school at UCLA, and uh, I enjoy teaching undergraduate students. 
Um, at SMU, professors teach undergraduate students directly. We do not have a graduate program. Uh, our department, at least for the science department, doesn't have a graduate program. But our center uses all the resources for educating undergraduate students and exposing undergraduate students with the policy-making process. And I believe that will be a good thing for um, for society, for the function of uh, American democracy. Currently, higher education is a very big topic in the United States. It is very costly, and that is one of the topics uh, in the US presidential election. Um, and then uh, people are talking about how to uh, cover the cost. Uh, one of the uh, candidates say, you, know, you should make all the higher education free. And then the other candidate says, um, the uh, higher education, uh, in order to cover higher education, we should increase the scholarship. SMU has a very high tuition, and then people say, well, you know, SMU tuition is so high. Actually, it's not just a high tuition, but also many opportunities for scholarship. So in the United States, the, for higher education, it is true that it's costly, but at the same time, there are many opportunities for, um, for um, um, getting the scholarship to cover the tuition. So that is SMU, um, and then so you know, I'm saying this because uh, um, you know usually the TV program starts with commercial. So uh, um, and well, and the next commercial is about Tower Center. So Tower Center is a policy institute, policy center um, that is, but at the same time, is an education um, policy center uh, in SMU, and it's located in Dallas. That is the only policy. Um, center uh, in, uh, that is affiliated with the university, and that is very uh, important. We did uh, 50 programs uh, last year. We are end of the semester. Actually, we finished the, uh, um, the school year, uh, the beginning of the summer term right now. Uh, we did uh, 50 programs in within the six months, so it's about that we did um, two programs uh, in, a, in a week. Uh, some of the programs are like a very short program, like the one hour, one hour the very formal conversation uh, over coffee. Um, some of the programs are like bigger, like the, this one, like a um, one-day conference or even a like two-day conference. But altogether, we are doing a 50 program. We are, I'm very proud that uh, uh, we are doing it, and I'm very proud of the staff members that support all those um, programs. Some star program on Japan and East Asia, which I'm directing, was esta originally established in 1996 as a star program in Japanese studies. Uh, it was originally sponsored by Hitachi and Sony. And, uh, in, so, uh, and in 1996, it was established as a Japanese studies program. Um, well, uh, so this is 2016, so this is the 20th year anniversary of the establishment of the Soundstar program. And that is why uh, we uh, are doing uh, this symposium in Japan for the first time outside of that. Two years ago, we received the uh, big grant from Japan Foundation, um, which uh, we have, uh, um, uh, uh, so uh, uh, from which uh, two people are here uh, today. Uh, let me let acknowledge uh, those people, uh, Mr. Masato Yamamoto. So um, thank you very much for your support. Um, so in 1990, so uh, in two years ago, Japan Foundation we received a grant from Japan Foundation, and we were uh, going to uh, expand our activities. Um, when we were thinking about what to, how to expand the organization, first of all, uh, I'm actually a China specialist. Um, working on Chinese politics, um, especially the political economy of rural China. Um, so um, I'd like to um, include China in the scope. Originally the Japanese studies program, but then we include the, uh, China in the scope. And um, so, uh, but at the same time, uh, we, first of all, we have to like, uh, keep the name in Japan, because it was originally established by Hitachi and Sony, and then we, are, uh, we received a grant from the Japan Foundation, so, um, so I just, we decided uh, to have Japan uh, before East Asia, and then 
saying some stuff from Japan and East Asia. Probably that is, as long as I know, that is the only East Asia center in the nation that has Japan before East Asia. So it makes the sound stop program very unique. Well, also, um, when I talked with uh, several people uh, who have been working with Japan, um, such as Ambassador Tom Schieffer, uh, who lives in Dallas, and also who is a board member of the Tower Center, we agree that actually Japan is still important um, for the United States to manage China. Um, and so in that sense, the increasing importance of China has made Japan even more important, not less important. So that was the idea behind the name of the, ch the, the, the change of the name of the Sunstar program in 2014. And since then, Approximately, we have done about 10 programs, 10 out of 50 programs in our center, um, doing um, East, Asian, um, uh, East Asian topic um, for our program. Well, sometimes I organize a program on Chinese domestic politics for some stuff program. And then I'm asked, so it's a Japan program, right? So why do we have to know about Chinese domestic politics? Well, in order to understand U.S.-Japan relationship, you have to know about Chinese domestic politics, uh, which I'm going to talk a little bit uh, more about, a little bit about um, more um, tomorrow, but uh, uh, that's actually what I usually try to argue. Dallas is a very interesting city. I didn't know about Dallas. I didn't, I have, I have never been to any uh, part of the south or southwest of the nation before I was invited to the uh, interview for, uh, for SMU. But I found Dallas to be very interesting, very dynamic city. I'm a big, huge baseball fan, so uh, uh, Dallas has a, a team called Texas Rangers, uh, which was not that very big major team um, in Japan, but uh, currently for some reason it became a very famous team uh, in Japan. Um, um, so, um, well, in, um, so, at the same time, when I arrived in Dallas, um, I found that, uh, you know, I didn't see many like, connection connections uh, with uh, Japan. But uh, in 2009, uh, Ambassador Schieffer is back uh, to, to Dallas. Uh, he is originally from Dallas, uh, but he always corrects us that you know, he's not from Dallas, he's from Portos. Um, but uh, the, America, in the United States is a country of region, and so um, so uh, in 2009, um, Ambassador Schiffer is back to uh, Dallas, uh, or DFW, Dallas Fort Worth. Um, and then uh, in 2012, um, today's uh, keynote speaker, Admiral Patrick Walsh, is back to his hometown, uh, to Dallas, um, for, for the first time in 30 years, more than 30 years, about 40 years, um, since uh, he left for Annapolis. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, so in 2012, Admiral Walsh was back, and then of course I knew that you know what he did, that he had done as a um, uh, commander of the Pacific Fleet, and then he commanded uh, Operation Tomodachi uh, in 2011. Um, so now Dallas has a former ambassador to Japan and the former commander of the Pacific Fleet, and I don't think there are so many cities in the United States that has both former ambassador to Japan and former uh, commander of the Pacific Fleet. And then also, as I said, Dallas has the best Japanese play baseball player uh, for Texas Rangers. Um, and, uh, and then also, last uh, year, uh, Toyota has moved its head North American headquarters to Dallas from Los Angeles. So um, now uh, Dallas also has one of the biggest uh, Japanese multinational corporations headquarters. So when I came to Dallas in 2008, uh, the population was uh, 6 million people. Now it has 7 million people, more than seven, slightly more than 7 uh, million people. Which means in 8 years, um, the population has increased 150,000 people per year. Uh, that's the fastest growing city uh, in terms of population and also in terms of economy. 
So and what is interesting is uh, uh, originally Texas and Dallas uh, are not so uh, internationalized uh, in the United States compared to the other big cities in the U.S. But actually, currently, uh, under the age of the rise of anti-internationalism in the United States, Dallas is really internationalized. And I'm really very excited uh, with uh, in, in the city that is uh, um, more and more diversified and then uh, more and more internationalized. Today's uh, symposium and today and tomorrow's symposium will not be possible uh, without the help of the many uh, people, uh, especially our co-host, um, Keio University's Global Security uh, Research Institute, uh, GSEC. Um, especially the one that who, can, who cannot make it today and tomorrow, uh, Dr. Heizo Tatenaka, uh, who was a speaker of the Soundstar uh, Sound Symposium in 2012 um, in Dallas. Uh, he, uh, as a former director of the uh, GSEC, he helped, um, uh, he helped us uh, tremendously. And also, uh, Deputy um, Director of the GSEC, uh, Dr. Motohiro Tsuchiyas, He, um, he was, uh, uh, he helped us a lot. And then also, uh, he is not here, uh, uh, administrative, admin, administrative head of the um, GSET, uh, Jimucho of the GSET, um, Mr. Um, Tetsuro uh, Hirono-san uh, helped us a lot. Uh, very, very interesting. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce a few um, people who um, helped us, who helped me to organize uh, this event. Uh, first of all, uh, Professor Ryosei Kotobun, uh, the, uh, the president of the National Defense Academy. Also, Professor Kotobun was uh, one of the speak keynote speakers of the 2013 um, Soundstar uh, Symposium um, in Dallas. Um, also, another uh, the speaker of the uh, 2012 uh, Soundstar uh, Symposium, um, Professor uh, Yoshihide Soeda. Soeda Sensei. And also um, the one that who is has been supporting uh, our activity, uh, who was supporting our activity uh, tremendously, uh, former uh, consul, uh, consul general uh, of Japan in Houston, uh, the Honorable uh, Dozon Tadaoka. Now, uh, before introducing this today's speaker, I'd like to have the remarks from uh, the director of the Tower Center, uh, Dr. Jim Hartley. Sensei and my colleague Takeuchi Sensei. 
So uh, we have a very, very special uh, uh, relationship with KU, and I want to uh, really uh, thank uh, our GSEC in particular for hosting this uh, meeting uh, with us. Uh, just a few more comments about the Tower Center. Uh, the Tower Center is, um, uh, we have a couple of things that we do, I think, extremely well. Um, one is uh, actually international economics, economic policy. Uh, we have a very deep uh, bench, a lot of strength looking at uh, economic issues, global economic issues. Uh, working, for example, with the Dallas Federal Reserve Bank, we've had many uh, conferences with them over the years. So I think we do understand and we, we do a lot of interesting research on the global economy. Uh, we also have, as uh, you can see from this meeting, uh, a great strength in security. Uh, that has been one of the, the, uh, the most important uh, both side uh, for the Tower Center. Uh, you're going to hear from some of my colleagues who work in this area uh, today and tomorrow, uh, one of whom uh, is sitting over here to my left, and I guess uh, you're going to introduce uh, the Admiral in a few minutes. Uh, but I think the Tower Center brings together um, uh, scholars, academics, uh, and in true Texas fashion, uh, we want to look for things that are practical, things that have some real-world uh, implications. Uh, so, you know, my colleague, Professor Rovner, who you'll hear from tomorrow, who's one of the great scholars of uh, international security, uh, uh, stresses how important it is that uh, our research have, uh, that it be connected in some way. Uh, let's have it. Um, so, we do have these two areas of expertise, security on one side, the global economy, I would say, on the other side. Uh, but as Professor Takeuchi mentioned, we also study American politics, American government. Uh, we are an officially nonpartisan center, uh, so uh, we have to be careful uh, what we say about politics. Uh, uh, but I think uh, uh, it's going to be possible to spend a day or two here in Japan or anywhere else in the world uh, without talking about the American. Uh, and just how much is at stake, you know, in this election. Uh, so I think I will just leave it at that for the moment. Um, and uh, uh, finally, uh, I would like to uh, hope that many of you will have the opportunity uh, to come and visit us someday in Texas. I know many of you in this room have been there before, uh, but I would like to personally extend a warm Texas welcome to any of you who have to be coming through uh, that part of the United States, uh, again, uh, for better or worse, the center of political and economic gravity in the United States has been shifting pretty dramatically uh, to, uh, to Texas, to the heartland, uh, and as Professor Becky, which you mentioned, uh, it's a very, very rapidly growing part uh, of the United States. So I'm looking forward uh, in the next few days to meeting many of you personally, the next couple of days, I should say and uh, to talking with you more about the Tower Center, uh, about SMU, uh, about Texas, American politics, Japanese politics. Um, and I, I think I would be remiss before I sit down, uh, I didn't really thank my colleague, Dr. Yuchi Sensei, because none of us would be here in this room uh, were it not for his diligence, his work. Uh, and uh, he knows this. Uh, I was charged with uh, searching for uh, someone who could uh, teach Japanese politics, someone who could eventually direct this program, and um, I think it was my idea uh, to rename the program, <laughs> the program on Japan and East Asia. I wasn't thinking when I did that uh, to elevate Japan as uh, you know, the leader necessarily of East Asia, uh, but I. When I saw uh, uh, this young scholar's uh, CV, and I noticed that uh, he was a Japanese national, uh, trained at Keio, uh, with degrees from Berkeley and UCLA, but an expert on China. And I said to myself, this is, we're squaring the circle here. This is the perfect combination, because we really need someone who can teach China, who understands China, but also can lead our program on Japan. So this program would not 
exist in its current form uh, were it not for the leadership of uh, uh, Takayuchi uh, Hiroki. So I think uh, before I invite him back up to introduce our speaker for today, uh, we should all give him a very warm round of applause and thank you.
pushed against each other at a rate of three inches per year. For reasons that we do not understand, when all that force was released some 70 miles off the coastline of Sendai, it displaced 10 billion tons of water, moving at the speed of a jet, 500 miles an hour racing to the coastline. The wave reached a height of 133 feet, like an egg beater churning. It reached inland six and a half miles and then grabbed everything within its reach and pulled it out to sea. When the wave hit Fukushima, the power plant had actually shut down as designed and lost primary, secondary, and tertiary power. So that the six operating plants, two of which were in reserve, one offline, created a meltdown condition in three of the plants, and the chemical reactions caused an explosion that blew the roof off of all three buildings. 400,000 homes destroyed, lives disrupted, 20,000 lives lost, and we ask ourselves, as we arrive on the scene, what are we looking at? We are looking at the conditions that prompt the evacuation of Hanshu. That's how serious and catastrophic this series of cascading casualties were taking place. When we arrived on the scene, we were behind. Radiation was in the atmosphere. It had leached into the ground. It was in the water supply. It was in the food supply. It was being tracked all around the country by tracked vehicles. <coughs> the topic is timely because it gives us a chance of reflection, discussion, and debate. What were the enduring lessons from Operation Tomodachi? And do those lessons apply today to the environment that we are experiencing as we are watching a changing landscape in the world around us? In today's discussion, you will hear a predominant influence of the role that the maritime perspective plays in this discussion. In the Asia-Pacific region today, maritime conditions influence a lot. They influence national security planning. They influence economic exchange and societal de development. More than any location or any other aspect in the global environment. In this region, the maritime narrative influences the largest populations, the largest economies, and the largest militaries. So nations that have the desire and the capability to protect their economic interests and want to ensure their stability and secure the key lines of approach to their future need maritime capability. As a result, decisions made about maritime forces directly impact the protection, the representation, and the ability of a nation to defend its sovereign interests at sea. In this region, sea power is an essential element of national power. We are in the Pacific Century, where sea power resumes its traditional role in the sea lines of communication as an instrument of peace, of stability, and a protector of trade and development. Nations in the region are watching with keen interest the effect that the United States' political climate and economic future are woven together and the challenges that they present, as well as the strain of a decade and a half of continuous warfare. 
many are wondering, is the United States in a position to remain forward and engage and ready? And what are the implications of a strategic partnership with Japan? As we try and put together our understanding of the security environment, these questions will play out not only tonight, but tomorrow in tomorrow's discussions. So what I'd like to suggest is that we take as best we can in the time we have available an interdisciplinary approach, rather than just simply looking through the lens of the military instrument. You can go to the first slide, please. To examine Asia Pacific today, we cannot omit the role that history continues to play. It influences our thinking, it shapes the current trends, and it complicates the challenges with a very dynamic, changing power landscape. Remember what this area has meant to us over the past seven decades. This area has a framework at the cost of great treasure for the countries of the region that has put in place formalized security agreements. Those security agreements bring opportunity for entrepreneurship, for free trade, for a rules-based system, for institutions which allow for globalization and all that prosperity that can come from it. Today, there is real pressure on the ability to align goals with resources, to understand the trends and the projections on sustainability into the future, specifically the strengths that it puts on the future of the U.S.-Japan relationship. I start here. This is what happens when you put the Army in charge of describing the world. It looks like 70% of the world is a land feature. It's not. But it's an example of how a chart can purport to give us a picture and can confuse us at the same time. It's easy to forget that 70% of the Earth's feature is water. This chart comes from the Unified Command Plan, which is presented to the President of the United States every two years. The colors represent the areas of responsibility for military commanders. It suggests, through its depiction, that areas can be defined with latitude and longitude and straight lines completely missing out on the role that culture and history can play in the way that we present ourselves as a national instrument. It's easy to forget what this same picture might have looked like in 1946, where there were 51 countries comprised in the community of nations. Today, that number is 197, if you count Tibet, Taiwan, and Vatican City, the addition of South Sudan. 197 countries in a very short period of time suggest that there is a very strong human drive for identity, for sovereignty, for uh, cultural and ethnic identity. What this chart can also depict for us is the important role that geography plays. If you focus particularly on the Middle East, you'll see the influence of Europe, Africa, and Asia all concentrated in one area. An area that is the religious home of 1.7 billion Muslims. In 1905, there was a continental strategist by the name of Halford McKinley who described what he called the strategic pivot. His theory, his assertion, was that 
if land forces could identify the right area of geography, they could exercise control and influence well beyond their reach because they could pivot north, south, east, and west, and they could influence economically, politically, as well as militarily. That thinking influenced the way people positioned themselves in the great game between inside modern-day Afghanistan, between the British Empire and the Russian Empire. Our question was, can we take some of those ideas and apply them to sea? If we do, then we can identify key areas where the presence of maritime forces can have impact. What that means now is that geography can play a very important role at sea. So for nations that are trying to determine what matters, what area is of specific consequence, what we can see here is that there are several areas identified in this 100 million square mile area that crosses over 15 time zones. Some areas have direct impact on the day-to-day -day quality of your lives. I would suggest one of those areas is the South China Sea, where there are 70,000 container ships that travel through the Straits of Malacca each year, where $5 trillion, trillion dollars of economic activity flow through the region. Any disruption of maritime security in that region affects more than just one flag on one ship. With 95% world trade on the water, with a majority coming through Asia Pacific region, there are consequences to disruptions to security and stability in this part of the world. So what happens now when we start to take a look not only at politics and, and economics, but let's look at individual growth over time. So, here we go. First, the taxes for health. Life expectancy. From 25 years to 75 years. And down here, an access for wealth. Income per person. $400,000, $4,000, and $40,000. So, down here is poor and sick. And up here is rich and healthy. Now, I'm going to show you the world 200 years ago, in 1810. Here come all the countries. Europe, brown, Asia, red, Middle East, green, Africa, South of Sahara, blue, and the Americas, yellow. And the size of the country bubble showed the size of the population. And in 1810, it was pretty crowded down there, wasn't it? All countries were sick and poor. Life expectancy were below 40 in all countries. And only the UK and the Netherlands was slightly better off, but not much. And now, why start the world? The Industrial Revolution makes countries in Europe and elsewhere move away from the rest. But the colonized countries in Asia and Africa, they are stuck down there. And eventually, the Western countries get healthier and healthier. And now, we slow down to show the impact of the First World War and the Spanish flu epidemic. What a catastrophe! And now I speed up through the 1920s and the 1930s, and in spite of the Great Depression, Western countries forge on towards greater wealth and health. Japan and some others try to follow, but most countries stay down here. Now, after the tragedies of the Second World War, we stop a bit to look at the world in 1948. 1948 was a great year. The war was over, Sweden topped the medal table at the Winter Olympics, and I was born. But the differences between the countries of the world was wider than ever. The United States was in the front, Japan was catching up, Brazil was way behind, Iran was getting a little richer from oil, but still had short lives. And the Asian giants, China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Indonesia, they were still poor and sick down here. But look what is about to happen. Here we go again. In my lifetime, 
former colonies gained independence and then finally they started to get healthier and healthier and healthier and in the 1970s then countries in Asia and Latin America started to catch up with the Western countries. They became the emerging economies. Some in Africa follows. Some Africans were stuck in civil war and others hit by HIV. And now we can see the world today in the most up-to-date statistics. Most people today live in the middle. But there are huge differences at the same time between the best of countries and the worst of countries. And there are also huge inequalities within countries. These bubbles show country averages, but I can split them. Take China, I can split it into provinces. There goes Shanghai. It has the same wealth and health as Italy today. And there is the poor inland province of Guizhou. It is like Pakistan. And if I split it further, the rural parts are like Ghana in Africa. And yet, Despite the enormous disparities today, we have seen 200 years of remarkable progress. That huge historical gap between the West and the rest is now closing. We have become an entirely new converging world. And I see a clear trend into the future with aid, trade, green technology and peace. It's fully possible that everyone can make it to the healthy, wealthy corner. Well, what you just see in the last few minutes is a story of 200 countries shown over 200 years and beyond. It involves plotting of 120,000 numbers. Pretty neat, huh? Everyone's moving to the healthy, wealthy corner of the chart. So what does that look like when you roll it up and you look beyond uh, individuals and start looking at it in terms of the economies of countries in this region. It looks like an economic miracle. As we dig further and look at where all this is coming from and how it's coming together, we can see all the trade activity, all the economic activity that's taking place at sea. And if you were to look at the specific trading lines, these are the sea lines of communication that you hear referred to as often as you do in these discussions. Another way of looking at what the professor was saying in terms of everybody moving to the healthy, wealthy corner, my interpretation of that is look for the demand for resources because that's what it's going to take in order to feed and to, uh, to care for a population around the world that continues to grow. And when you do that, now what we're finding in this demand for resources in this region is we're starting to see real issues, issues that are starting to come to the surface and provide real friction between nations in the region. We have had disputed claims between countries in the region for decades, and yet countries were pragmatic enough in order to work through differences so that differences remained between countries, but they were respected and not challenged openly with an intent of, of creating now more tension and escalation in the region. 